this is summertime. So get happy with the choir school and reserve your concert tickets and Broadway raffle tickets today at choirschoolofdelaware.org. That's choirschoolofdelaware.org. Choirschoolofdelaware.org. Hello, everyone, and welcome to And the Beat Goes On. We're so excited to be with you today. My name is Arianne Harley Emerson, and I'm the Director of Music and Operations here at the Choir School of Delaware. We are so thrilled to be on episode 12. I can't believe that this has been, this pandemic has been going on so long. And I'm super excited that this week we have on Mr. Stephen Flaherty, composer of a musical such as Susical, uh, Ragtime, Music for Anastasia, and so, so, so much more. Once on this island, so many great shows. So thank you for being with us today, Stephen. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So excited. We also have some other folks with us from the choir school today, and I'm going to have them introduce themselves. Why don't we start with Miss Vanilla? Hi, my name is Vanilla. I've been at the choir school for two years and I'm excited to see everyone and ask some questions today. Awesome, thank you, Vanilla. And how are you doing today, Miss Indira? Hi, um, I'm Indira. I've been part of the choir school for three years now. Um, and I'm just really excited to get to know his backgrounds and all the music he's ri written. Awesome, and we also have Brittany on the line. Hi, I'm Brittany Stanton. I am the Director of Education and Assistant Conductor here at the choir school. Awesome. So thank you all for joining us. And Stephen, tell us, how are you doing during this pandemic? You know, I'm, I'm doing as best as, as I can, as we all are. You know, we're, we're just trying to find uh, the way to keep uh, going forward. And so um, uh, my partner, writing partner, Lynn Ahrens and I, we had been in rehearsal uh, for a new show uh, at the Oslo Repertory Theater in Sarasota uh, whenever everything uh, became locked down. So we were in the middle of our third week of rehearsal, just finishing things up. And uh, we were gearing up for what would be our first orchestra rehearsal, which would have been the following week. And basically uh, we were told that the production was, you know, was closing like so many, you know, everybody that was in rehearsal at that time. And uh, there was something about uh, the show because it's, it was a very small, um, show about community. Uh, it's called Knoxville. It's based on uh, a James Ag novel about uh, called Death in the Family. That's about uh, one American family uh, when a crisis hits and how they react to the crisis and how they try to turn it around to become a positive thing and become like a piece of art and and hopefully strengthening them and allowing them to go forward. And considering that that was what the show was about, whenever this happened, it was like it was like reflecting what we were actually working on. So, um, you know, everybody had to basically run to the four corners of the earth to, to try to get back to their families and their homes and their loved ones safely. And um, we were lucky that really within two weeks, we were told by the theater's management that our show uh, was going to be able to be rescheduled for next season. So that was good. So, uh, cause there was something about not being able to get across the finish line, which is frustrating, you know, uh, for, for everybody, you know, and the fact that we will get across the finish line and we will get in front of an audience is wonderful. You know, it's, it, it will just be next May. So we have a bit of a pause there and, you know, I hope we can keep our focus and our goodwill and our inertia and I think we will. I think I think the actors were very grateful, you know, that we would be able to do do this and get get this piece in front of an audience. And um, you know, it, we had become very very close uh, in those couple of weeks. So um, you know, we did a we did a cast Zoom call, and it was actually the evening that we had gotten the news that our production would happen. 
you know, next year. So. Oh my goodness. Well, I'm, I'm happy to hear that it's rescheduled. Yes. And um, do you think that you'll make any changes uh, between well, now and then? Well, you know, it, it, it's it's funny. You never say never because I always I always try to go into a rehearsal with most things figured out and put on paper and, you know, even vocal arrangements. And then you get into that room and then you find that you're writing for a very specific group of instruments. Like these actors are very unique. And so instantly you wind up uh, changing vocal parts, writing things that fit them better, you know, because you're like a tailor, you know, you have this material, but the material is not the suit, you know, and you can't make the suit until you know the person that's going to be wearing that particular suit and you tailor it to their very special individual characteristics voice. So I could say that we will make no changes, but don't hold me to that because we'll get in that room and I, and I know what will happen. So it's, and it's, a, it's a cool piece because we're using a lot of our actors who also are musicians. So oh, we cool. have a wonderful fiddler who's also an actor and a, a singer and a composer. Um, I think I counted heads and we, we actually had seven different songwriters in that room. You know, people uh, that are from the Nashville world. It's, it's sort of a folk kind of a score. So there's a lot of guitar playing, mandolin, uh, keyboard, you know. So it's, 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 really, it's really sort of a different kind of a thing for me. And it's more of a community-based kind of a group, group effort. So, yeah, awesome. Pretty, that's pretty interesting. That's it really is. cool to hear. And what are you doing in the midst of COVID-19 and, and, you know, kind of being at home? Like, yeah. are you, are you able, are you still, are you writing? Are you just preparing? So what are you, how are you well, kind well, of making well, you music? Know, I, I think in the early, early days and weeks of this, I think there were a lot of people that felt like, oh, I have to do all of these great things. I have to write my great American novel. I have to write my symphony. I have to, you know, and, and I think honestly, what we have to do is just, live each day it, to the fullest, whatever that means for us. You know, I, I have not been able to get back working on a new show because, you know, we, we had been doing that. And then we have another show uh, called Marie that we did in Seattle last year that's mm -hmm. supposedly, you know, bound for Broadway. But whether, you know, what, whether there's going to be a Broadway, we don't know. You know, so everything is sort of in this weird, like, neutral place. So in lieu of knowing what the next big idea is. I've been doing a lot of projects for love. So uh, I, I've been involved with a, a record project called Artists in Resonance, which is songwriters writing songs from their homes and recording them mm. and uh, the, the artists singing them. Everybody basically is recording in their like bathroom, you know, <laughs> or their kitchen or wherever they are. And so it's, uh, it, it's been an interesting project. So I, I've contributed to the song to that and I think I think that comes out next week on Broadway Records and um, also I wrote a choral piece I was asked by uh, the Gay Men's Chorus of Washington DC who had been singing a lot of my music if uh, Lynn and I would write a piece for them for their 40th anniversary and I just thought there's nothing better right now than to put something that has joy and it's actually about why people need to sing together you know, and I thought there needs to be something in this time of isolation that brings people together. So I think the, the plan now is uh, they were going to premiere it for their uh, next season. But I think now they're going to try to do one of these virtual, virtual choruses. Yeah. We were talking a little bit before we went on the air about that, how tricky it is and, you know, just, just getting everybody together. So I, I think that that's what they're thinking now. So it might not be the most finessed or perfect performance. Yeah. performance, but yet, you know, I, I, I said, I think the world just needs joy and I think it needs a sense of community and it needs, to, this is a new uh, piece that's about community. And I, I thought just, we should just put it out there. You know? Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Well, we definitely will be looking forward to that. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna open up uh, to uh, questions here. Why don't I start first with Vania? Do you have a question for Mr. Flaherty today? Um, yes, I wanted to know how you first got into music when you were younger or whenever you started. Well, you know, my, my parents, uh, neither of them were professional musicians, but they were parents who valued music. They saw it as a worthwhile thing. My father is an amateur. Well, he, he passed a, uh, 15 years ago, but he was 
uh, an amateur trumpet player. And he would always be playing uh, in the attic after our dinner. And so there was always music in the house. My sisters and brothers uh, all play. My younger brother plays nine instruments. So he, he, he studied three of them. And, and then the rest he taught himself. So he plays everything from the trombone to the tuba, to the electric bass, to the banjo. I mean, and he's very eclectic in his interests. So I think we were all just exposed to music. Um, I was lucky that uh, I, was, I was a smart little kid in school and they were going to move me to, to the next grade. <laughs> and I have an older brother who's literally like, two weeks and a year older than me. And I think my parents thought that's a bad idea to have like two brothers in the same grade, but they're like, you know, one's older, one's younger. So my parents literally, they told me this later, they were trying to find a way to thwart me, to slow me down. They said, he needs a project, he needs a hobby, he needs something that's, that basically will slow him down from schoolwork. And so they randomly picked music. They said, would you like to have a piano lesson? And, you know, we didn't even have a piano. You know, uh, but I think they knew I had an ear because they've gotten a little toy piano for my younger brother. And instantly I grabbed it as my own and started playing things on it, you know, and trying to figure things out. So, um, yeah, so whenever I was seven, they sent me to piano lessons. And then whenever I, when, I, when I was 12, I went to a really good teacher who unfortunately did not like kids. <laughs> he was very, he was a very rough guy, yeah. And he drove me crazy, but he made me a musician. You know, and he, I, he opened up the, the world for, for me for music. You know, I, he, he taught me the classics, he taught me theater music, he taught me composition, harmony. Um, and I realized that I could play by ear from the time I was very small. And he could never figure that out. He always thought that you needed everything written down as a piece of music in front of you. And in fact, I could just hear something and make it up where I would do variations on anything I would hear. And uh, I grew up with all different kinds of music around me. And I, I wrote my first musical when I was 14. So I was a freshman in high school. And my, friend, my friends, they, they, they thought that they deserved better parts in the school musical. You know, they were like in tiny roles. So they thought, screw this, we're gonna write our own musical. So they wrote the book and lyrics uh, for a musical that was about my hometown of Pittsburgh. And it was a comedy, musical comedy. And they needed somebody to write music. And they said, do you wanna write the music? And I had never even thought of that. You know, I had never done that. And so I thought, oh, well, that sounds fun. And I found out that I could, I could do it really well. And of course, it being the first score that I had ever written, it was not that original. Like I had one song that was an R&B song. I had one song that was a country Western song. I had one song uh, that was a rock and roll song, one that was a show tune. Every scene had a different musical sound to it, you know, and I was basically imitating and you know things that I had heard, uh, but I found it was really fun, and I started writing my own words and music all through high school, and then I went to college. And at that time, there was no composition or music writing program for theater. It, it like didn't exist. Now there are many of them, you know, but back in the, in the day there wasn't. So I thought I'm just going to go to a school where there are a lot of people that are interested in music and theater, and I'm just going to figure it out once I get there. And so I went to Cincinnati and uh, for four years, that's what I did. And I sort of wrote my musicals in the back alleyway because it wasn't considered serious, you know? <laughs> so mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I was just following my own instinct and then I came to New York City and then there were many, many people here that were interested in what I was interested in as well. And my writing partner, I met her in the very, the first six months that I was in New York City and we began writing. So that's really rare, you know, to meet your husband or wife or music partner, you know, that the, the odds are probably several trillion to one, you know, and I was lucky that I was there at that one spot at that one time and we, we wrote very differently. She was like an improv person and I was like a write down classical person, but, you know, we suited one another and, um, and we began to write and that's more than 30 years ago. So, so that's amazing. That's a long that time. Is, I know it's that a, is a wow. long partnership. It, My it, gosh. It, 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 it is. And it's interesting because, you know, you think like how, what sustains that, you know, you know, and I, you know, being Irish Catholic, I always had this sort of bit of gloom and doom that was kind of in me, you know, it's in, in the fabric of who we are as a people, you know, you're always waiting for like the good moment to be taken away or, you know, it's, 
it, it, I had to develop the concept of faith, not meaning like, you know, God faith necessarily, but the idea that things will continue and you'll find a way to have that and, you know, and that you can manifest that. And it's, it's a true thing. It's a real thing. I think. Awesome. Yeah. And Indira, um, do you have a question for us today? I do actually. So um, this past year before COVID shut down on um, my whole school district, we had the opportunity to have Susical performed at our high school. So oh, I, I got to sit in at the practices and I um, heard most of the music and I was just very intrigued on how you were inspired to write it. I just want to know the background thinking. Well, you know, it, it's, it, that was an interesting thing because most of when, when we pick a project, a lot of it has to do with what we've just done. You know, that sounds like a weird statement, but it's, it's true. So like after I do something that's basically comedic, I feel like, and, and shows, you know, I, they take a long time to write, you know, so you have to be so in love with what you're doing because it's going to take you a minimum of four years, you know, and some of them are much, much longer. And uh, so Susical came, we wrote that after Ragtime. And uh, you would think they would have no connection at all because one is written, one is a, a dramatic piece that's based on a great American novel, and one is uh, a more lighthearted piece uh, based on children's literature. But at the, at the same time, we, we thought it could be really interesting because with Susigal, we wanted to show that there are many different kinds of families. And by not being stuck in any one time or country or culture, you know, we could sort of, because, you know, they're, they're Dr. Seuss characters, they sort of live in their own world, you know, and we, so we could sort of pull back from that. And the thing I think that we were most proud of is that at the end of that particular story, there's um, a family that's a nuclear family, which is the Who family. And there's also a very non-traditional family that is an elephant, uh, a bird with one feathered tail and an elephant bird. And so there are these two different kinds. And we began to think that there's something about this piece that we could say, what defines a family? And also that everybody, it's, it's your duty to let your voice be heard, you know, and uh, to step up to the plate. And in fact, like the smallest person of all who's, you know, been, you know, considered, you know, not worthy for, for the entire show. In fact, he's the person who lifts his voice up at the end and actually saves the entire planet. You know, and we thought there's some something very profound about that. And with Susical, um, we we got we got licensed to use all of the books, which was really interesting. So we could use any of the different storylines, and uh, it became like a multi-character uh, story or play, it, like like Ragtime oddly was. You know, and, and the idea that you know we were uh, sort of creating the book from different found objects. And that, that, was, that was a challenge and it was also fun. And there was something about, uh, as I was writing that show, I was turning 40. <laughs> and there's something about being able to go and tap back into your childhood and you know, the, the joy of telling stories and the joy of just making sounds. You know, so uh, we would be reading those, uh, those Dr. Seuss books aloud to one another because there was something that was interesting because it was that language is really meant to be heard as opposed to like, you know, reading yak on a page I means something different than actually saying yak, you know? And that was, that was great fun. And for me as a composer, I wasn't stuck in any one culture or time period. Uh, it, it really gave me license to, to go in many different directions musically. So it, uh, so I, I was just basically being playful and, you know, things that amused me and things that made me feel good. And, you know, I, uh, I, I just like that, that there were really no restrictions. So we, it was as far as you would allow your imagination to take you. And, I, and I'm so touched because so many schools and young people are really drawn to that material. And I, I love that because originally we didn't have this, the smoothest opening in New York. And, and yet I knew that there was a wonderful show in there and that it could speak to a lot of people. And so it's, it's great to see all the different productions and to see everybody do their different take on it, which is terrific. And Brittany, do you have a question for us? I do, and this is related to Susical. Um, more recently, um, I became aware after teaching in a public school 
um, of the uh, interesting uh, origins of Dr. Seuss comics and how he had some kind of race, racial tones in those um, that some people have found very offensive. And I'm wondering, as those have come to light and people have started to take a stance on whether they use Seuss or not, what kind of uh, feedback you've gotten from Seussical? Well, we, we've not gotten feedback uh, about racial issues with Dr. Seuss, but you know, he, he, he was a very, he had a lot, he had a lot of political uh, uh, drawings and stories and, and uh, a lot, he also did work that was not just for children or families. You know, it, it was like, there, were, there was a lot of uh, pieces about fascism and, uh, and uh, the, the political cartoons, which sort of um, sort of manifest themselves in stories like the butter battle and, you know, the idea of uh, basically getting people to conform to one ideolog ideology as, as opposed to people's own, you know, thoughts and, you know, so we, we've gotten some early comments about, about those. But, um, you know, we're entering a new world, a new chapter of our history, which is, which is needed. You know, I think, it's, I think it's very necessary. And I think, you know, I think we need to examine everything and keep an open dialogue with one another as, as we go forward, clearly. Yeah. yeah. I know um, one of the things that I love um, kind of about your writing and your story and the intersection between kind of what Brittany is saying and is all of that is um, like you and Lynn have told so many stories um, and yeah. it's, it's amazing. Like next year we're doing a whole season where we're singing great literature, uh, choral arrangements of great literature. And then we're going to end our year and our gala next year with why we tell the story yes. because there are yes. so many books that you guys base you know uh you know your musicals on or great experiences yes. that people have had um yeah. i there are like ragtime once on this island uh, those are like great examples of how you're telling in such a beautiful way the stories of so many underrepresented people just thinking about ragtime today yeah. It's crazy. And actually, there's another show um, that not many people know, Dessa Rose. I'm, which... I'm, glad you, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I was, it's, it, it's a beautiful show. It's not, it's not done all that often, but when it does, when it is done, it's so powerful. Uh, we actually, there was a production uh, in London with Cynthia Arriva. Oh it's, my gosh, it's, it's probably Dessa. amazing. Yeah, and, and so many people that I knew that were able to see it, they said that was the most exciting piece that they had seen in a long while. But, you know, the politics of that, you know, scared me for a long time. Lynn wanted yeah. me to write that as early as um, 92, and it took 15 years. I had to write Ragtime first and, you know, to find a way into it. Can you tell us, uh, not everyone, most people don't know Dessa Rose. I yeah. am an, I, I did not know it until I did Why We Tell the Story, um, I guess. Yeah. 12 years ago at this point. Yeah. Um, and that was my first time experiencing it. And I remember reading through in the bend of my arm and just yeah. that, uh, just absolutely that's incredible. Great. Tell us that's about the show. That's my, favorite, that's my favorite song from the store, actually. You nice. know, uh, it's gorgeous. Well, it, it, it's, an, it's an interesting thing. It's, it's, a, it's a piece about the antebellum South. And uh, it's, it's about two women, one African-American, uh, uh, one white woman, and how they help one another and support one another and, and uh, uh, basically to go west, to go to freedom. And this woman who's, af who's basically afraid to, uh, the white woman who's afraid to leave this plantation, she's actually, her mind is opened up by this experience. And so um, uh, it's, it's a beautiful book. It's, it's a very challenging piece of literature though. And there are so many different moments uh, in it. And actually the two women who are the two central characters, they don't meet until the middle of the book. And so I, I, I just knew that as a piece of theater, we had to have them together somehow, uh, you know, at, at the beginning of the show, the downbeat. And so it, it wound up becoming about oral history as well. 
So they, these women play themselves at, at eight, uh, 80 plus and 15 and, and everything in, in between. Uh, and uh, it, it became about shared oral history. And uh, I couldn't find a way to get into it. And Lynn could, she said, I can see it so clearly in my head. So I said, can you write down what you're experiencing and what you think it could be and, and just a, a chunk of basically like a play. And that's the first time we've ever done that where she was writing like, here's like, an, here's act one. And then I went aside and I, you know, thought about it and then wrote music. And when we got together, basically I brought like a full hour of music she had never heard. And so, um, it, it was it was a beautiful show. It starred uh, Lashans, and it, we wrote the show for Lashans. And uh, there were other actors that we loved, and and we brought them in. We brought uh, Keisha Lewis, who was in the original Once on the Island, and she left the business. She had she had become a preacher, and then she was putting her toe back in the water of theater. And we said, if if we write a role for you, will you come to New York and do this? And Norm Lewis and James Stovall. Uh, Tina Fabrique, who had done our original um, ragtime demo, you know, these were all people that we knew and loved, and we actually wrote th these roles for them. So. It's it's such an amazing piece for anyone who's watching. I strongly encourage you to check out Dessa Rose. Uh, there's a ton of music in that that score. There's just so much music. I think it's two CDs, perhaps, it, it is of music. CDs. Yeah, yeah, because we couldn't, we couldn't, it's really a folk opera. We couldn't find mm -hmm. a way to squeeze it down and, and understand the story as a single CD. So we actually did, we actually recorded the entire show twice in one day. Everything was live. We went from cue to cue to cue to cue. The only, time we, the only time we stopped is because there was a, uh, a drill, somebody working outside the studio on a, on a sidewalk. It was like jackhammer, you know? Yeah. And all here, you know. So that was the only time during the entire, and I can't even remember how we got them to stop doing that, but, you know, it, but, but it, it just shows where these, the actors were so used to doing the show live and, you know, from going from scene to scene as opposed to, you know, recording songs out of order, which is how you do recordings a lot of the time for shows. And, and, and one thing about that piece is it's like what, as a composer, you nail just that Southern black sounds and the Appalachian sounds. It's like, I, I think all of, all of the writing that you do, I think is also, is always done in a great culturally sensitive way. And this one, there's something about it that it's just like, it reminds me of like when I was growing up and stuff that I would hear in church. And like, how did you? Well, I, I mean, every time I work on a piece that's not my own story, I have to find some way to basically allow myself permission to write that particular story. And uh, Dessa Rose, one of the two leads was, was a Caucasian person. And so she was sort of the outsider to this world. And I sort of began understanding and writing the world as like I was the outsider of that. I wrote very little of Dessa Rose at the piano. I wrote a lot of it while I was, uh, I, I didn't write it in an urban setting. I went out in, into like the country. I wrote it during the summer. I, I wrote a, a lot of it out, outside. You know, uh, I did a, a ton of research uh, because I wanted to really get, uh, this uh, Southern gospel tradition. I, I also listened to a lot of recordings that were made uh, from the Appalachian Hills. And you, you know, those early mm -hmm. recordings where they would just go from like little teeny village to little teeny village and just basically collect sound recordings of, of people. And, and you know, and you'd, you, you could hear five different people from five different pockets of the Appalachians sing the same song and it would be completely different, you know? And I found that fascinating. So I, I just really, you know, submerge myself in that much like with ragtime, there are many different kinds of ragtime, you know, and uh, I was a ragtime pianist as a teenager. And uh, I really wanted to un understand the different kinds of variety and, and also working with, with ragtime, our cast members, if, if you read the novel, or if you've seen the film, the uh, Harlem community is not even, it's like sort of marginalized. Like in the novel, 
Full House Walker and does not exist until he knocks on the door of Mother, who's the, you know, the Caucasian woman. And so we worked a lot with our cast and we wanted to make sure that we were telling the, the story of three groups of people. And we talked a lot about the ha Harlem culture. We all did our research and, uh, you know, it's not like we were doing a revival of a show that had been written like around the turn of the century. You know, we were writing a new show closer to the turn of another century. And we wanted to be really sensitive to those stories. And uh, our director allowed everybody to talk about their experience and talk about, you know, what was, what we needed, what we needed to make sure we put in the show to make sure that everything was balanced and everything was, you know, properly told. Mm -hmm. So, so, so we wrote, we wrote an entire backstory for Cole House, for Sarah, for all of the people in Harlem that's nowhere to be found in any other version of Ragtime because we thought we need to tell, we need to tell this story and we need to make these characters three dimensional, you know, he needs, we need to understand them and we need to feel for them. And so that was actually very much a group project. So. I, I mean, and Ragtime is definitely, uh, I, who doesn't love Ragtime? I think it's just one of the best shows out there. And I remember seeing it, uh, I saw it, I guess, not last summer, the summer before. And I felt it was extremely relevant at that time because it was in the middle of kind of like the Me yeah. Too movement. And, yeah. um, and there's also kind of the storyline of women's suffrage that was going on. Yeah. And uh, then it's like also, again today with what I know. we're experiencing with inequity in our country it's also like it's still <laughs> relevant i know and and in, in immigration i have several and yes who are dealing with immigration issues who are here on certain kinds of visas and they're contributing so much to the country and yet there's no clear way that they can become a citizen even even though you know they've contributed so much since their arrival here and uh you know, it's it, it, it's a piece. Well, we first we first started writing the piece in 1994. We had the world premiere in 1996, and it finally came to Broadway in '98. Mm -hmm. And here we are, 22 years later. And I, I think the themes are much more, mm -hmm. unfortunately, you know, resonating more. You know, you know, you would have thought we would have changed for the better in 22 years, but it, you know, here we are. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's one of the reasons why so many people are responding to that particular show right now. Yeah, it, it just seems like the, you've got kind of definitely like kind of the race element, the women's yeah. suffrage movement, immigration. There's just yeah. so, there's a lot that's going there, on. There, 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 there's, a, there's a lot. And, and also just the idea of getting people to uh, be mobilized politically. You know, the whole yes. Emmett Goldman, the whole yes. brother story. Um, Terrence McNally, our dear collaborator, who actually uh, unfortunately passed recently from COVID-related oh. symptoms in, in uh, March. His favorite character of the entire piece was younger brother because he said he actively becomes politicized and he actually finds that he does have a voice and he takes this energy that he never knew that he had and put it to a good cause. And he, you know, Terrence was so out uh, and so ahead of his time for so many years and till the very end. And uh, I, I think that he just saw that character as heroic. And yes. He, we, we all related to different characters, but that was his. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, what uh, what a show. If anyone is looking for kind of things, uh, art to help them kind of process current events, I definitely recommend Dessa Rose. Um, I definitely recommend Ragtime. Those are great pieces that we can come back to to help us process what's going on now. And also Once on This Island, too, is also another one that we can kind of take a look at and like yeah. groups of people and how do we inhabit together and can we be together? Also a very interesting story too. Yeah, yeah that, there's um, th there's a lot of interest in ones on this island right now as well. And our, our director of the recent revival, mm -hmm. he was, he, he's an amazing person named Michael Arden, who's also a director, but in casting the show, he also wanted it to feel all inclusive. So uh, 
uh, originally the, the piece was done as uh, uh, an all African American cast. And this, uh, he actually threw the casting up and, and it was more multicultural. Uh, he had uh, one actor playing a traditionally performed female role and another mm -hmm. actor playing uh, a, a, a woman playing a, a male role. And he really shook it up and changed it. And we were, we were seeing every possible kind of actor come through the door because we wanted to be as open and mm -hmm. inclusive. And he wanted any member of the audience who came through the door to see themselves in those gods, like, oh, that can be me. I right. You know, and it, it was it was an interesting thing. And also, yes. the original production was sort of uh, it, it. It's based on a book by a Trinidadian author, Rosa Gee, and she never says where the island is. It's sort of like a fantastical, mythical island. And uh, for this new production, we really wanted to center it in Haiti. That was really important to the production team and. Uh, to the director and the choreographer, who's a sensational modern dance choreographer called Camille A. Brown. And you should Google her because uh, there, there are examples of her work uh, on YouTube and she has her own company. She's fantastic. She said to me, she said, I really feel that we need to go back to the roots of Haitian music, Haitian rhythm, Haitian movement, because I really want to honor these people. And uh, I have to say the original production, I did all the dance music myself and I sort of, I, I sort of fudged it, you know, I, I didn't really have that understanding. And I said, yes, for this, let's, let's really throw out all of the dance music. Let's throw it out. Let's uh, bring in uh, pe people that can teach us this. And we, and we started from scratch and uh, what she came up with in this uh, last production was so authentic and so real and you know it was very exciting it, i loved it i saw it twice i think oh, oh, wow. uh, it was it, it it was fantastic and um the uh, i know the score is is pretty different from the original score like when i was listening there were some oh. some acapella parts that um well this is, this is an interesting thing this all came about from our director and we had a meeting it was one of those great exciting meetings that we uh -huh. had and he, his concept was what, what would happen, imagine if you're in, on this island and this giant storm, this hurricane comes and takes away everything from you. So you have no musical instruments and you mm -hmm. have nothing, basically no props other than discarded broken things around you. Can you, can you tell a story? Can you tell a theatrical story? Can you tell music? Uh, and so what we really tried to do is, what if we had only used found objects and um, the actor's voice? What could we do with that? Mm -hmm. and, and I thought that was, was thrilling. So mm -hmm. we actually brought in a guy who does nothing but creates music from junk. <laughs> and, and, and so we were right, making little xylophones out of pieces of glass that would be you know, stuck on a stick or shakers or you know, uh, tin drums and uh, we, we started the show with these pieces of hose that would create these sort of almost yeah, like yeah. electronic sounding like synthy things. And, you know, we, we would have workshops and we would do nothing but like, okay, we're going to, this is the junk workshop, pick up your favorite piece. And um, just trying to get it to tune, you know, and mm -hmm. we, bit by bit, we added, you know, musicians back in because I felt like you got to, you have, a, have to have a drummer, you have to have a bass. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. But uh, the vocal arrangements were very different. Some, some of yeah. them were the same, but a lot of them uh, were things that would be like keyboard pads, you know, like, like, like back in 1990, you'd go like this and you put your hands on a keyboard mm -hmm. and it would give like, you know, a pad that would fill a space with maybe a moving part. And here we said, all right, let's throw those keyboards away and let's try to do that with vocals. So we brought in, um, uh, an amazing woman who I'd always wanted to work with and I had never had, and I had never met her, but I admired her work. Uh, she did all the vocal arrangements for Spring Awakening and for some really cool shows. And her name is Anne-Marie Malazzo. So she reworked a lot of the vocals and she thought of it as like vocal orchestration. So like, mm -hmm. they're actually, originally our band had five players back in the day on Broadway. 
And now we had four. So he said, okay, let's make it even smaller. Let's see how much we can do with the voice. And uh, it, it was a fascinating process to watch. Yeah, it was something that I noticed right away. I was like, oh my gosh. I know. It was like, like it yeah. was it gave me chills like to, yeah, to, it, it to hear some very, of that very, stuff. It was very, very hard to do because yeah, I can imagine. Looks like that there's no tech at all. It's like, you know, it's in sand. There are a couple of crate mm -hmm. boxes. And what we had to do is we had to have teeny little speakers, monitors in those boxes that look like thrown away crates so people on that side of the theater could hear the people hear. on this side of the yeah. theater did a lot you know it's like very yeah. interesting vocal yeah. parts we had to find a way to lock i was just so impressed too with like i felt like people were just pulling pitches out of thin air i was just like where'd that come from like i i would have to it was I magical have to ask them i would say how long can you hear a pitch in your ear like leia salonga comes out oh. and, and, and she starts singing and, and it's like can you find an E if I put an E way over here and then you keep that in your ear for 45 seconds, you know? Yeah. Like how long can you hold your breath? I mean, a lot of this stuff is like dares. Uh -huh. And once you set it like that, then you have to find the other person that can do that because, you know, Leia might not be able to stay in your show forever. Yeah. And, and it was, it was, they were astounding musicians and, yeah. you know, and you, was, a lot of it did seem like pulling a pitch out of the air. It really did. I, they were, I, I mean, I was just like, what is, yeah. what are, are they... and you're holding like one pitch and somebody is like singing a second above you and then going down below and, you mm -hmm. know, and very cool. A, a lot of, a lot of the, a lot of the parts weren't like SATV. They weren't group singing. A lot of them were individual strands, you know, and it, it took us a very, a very long time to get it right. But it was, yes. it was great. It was, it, it's very exciting. And since we were revisiting something that we had done before, it actually in a weird way gave you all this freedom because we thought, well, we know that the story and we know that this moment works and this song works. So we could feel free to play with everything else. Uh, it, and and it, it really works. So it, 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 I mean, it, it's such a fantastic piece. Definitely look it out. Um, we're getting ready to uh, run out of time here, but um, I wanted to see, are there any last questions before we kind of go on to the next little bit? Um, nope, great. So uh, I wanted to play for folks on, we always like to play a little bit of music. Uh, so we're going to play a little a chunk of Indira singing Journey to the Past, which was yeah. part of a performance last year. She did a great job. Um, like I said, we're using a lot of broadband here because we're testing a virtual gala as we speak right now. I, I love it. On Thursday. You're a daredevil. So it's choppy, <laughs> I'm sorry. So here we go. Uh, this is uh, Journey to the Past sung by Indira. It's a little uh, snippet of it here. Great, wonderful. Universal. Great, great job. So much fun. One of our, definitely one of my favorite uh, tunes for sure. I love listening yeah. to that. Um, and 
as we go out today, we've got a little short 90 second game we're going to play today. Uh, ah. It's called our quarantine quiz. So okay. what we're going to do is it's basically reverse nose go. So you're going to put your finger on your nose if you've done this silly thing during quarantine. So Brittany will ask the questions um, and I'll have okay. a timer. <laughs> um, I'll hold up my timer here and we'll all play with you. So and, this, means uh, we, yeah, this means we have done this. If you put your finger on your nose, it means you have done it. So it's kind of the reverse. You do this. <laughs> yeah, right. I wish <laughs> I hadn't done it. <laughs> I wish I hadn't. Um, right. And so I'll hold up a timer and it will reveal a picture of a duck and it will quack when we're all out of time. Um, okay. And then we'll be done uh, and you'll be off the hook for today and uh, we'll sign off. So whenever you're ready, Brittany. Ready. Here we go. Skipped online school because your internet was down. Joined a virtual party. Lost track of the days of the week. Morphed into a nocturnal being. Logged onto Zoom with business attire on the top and pajamas on the bottom. Swimsuit. Sp <laughs> spoken to a friend you haven't caught up with in a while. Binge watch a show in 48 hours or less. Shopped online for something you didn't need. Hid away in your room because your family was driving you crazy. Buy snacks for a week and run out a day or two later after going to the store. <laughs> Worked from your bed. Forgot to brush your teeth. Slept past noon. Played a board game. Did a puzzle. Cut your own hair. Baked bread. Made a TikTok video. Spent more time on social media than off. <laughs> Taken a face mask selfie. Coughed and wondered. Skipped a shower. Gave into Tiger King. Made a new recipe. Purchased more than 10 rolls of toilet paper at a time. Became that person at Costco. <laughs> Pretended to be frozen or muted on Zoom have to beg someone to stay home. Attempt a virtual choir video. And we're all <laughs> out of time. Thank you so much for being with us today. We are so My pleasure. happy that you could come on and tell us about these beautiful stories that you are Thank telling. You. Thank um, you. If people want to keep up with you and what's coming up new, is there a place that folks can go? We have, we have a Facebook fan page, Lynn and myself. And it's Lynn Aarons and Stephen Flaherty. And we also have a website uh, that we need to update, <laughs> but it's aaronsandflaherty.com. And I, it's been my pleasure speaking with you all today. And uh, what I had said right before we went to air is one, one of my favorite unexpected things was joining a choir. And I don't have a very good voice. I'm like 10 or two, which means it can't be high, it can't be low. And, and yet I learned so much, not only about music, but about singing together, about breathing together and about being together as a community. And I think that that's what makes a choir an amazing thing. And I, I just love the work that you're doing with the kids. So keep it thank up. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your work and Lynn's work as well. Tell her hello. We're so thrilled to be able to talk to you today. So we know you got to run, but thank you so much for joining Thanks. us and take Thanks. care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.